Hello, everyone. How are you? Gently close your eyes. We want to be able to predict outcomes so that we have a sense of control. To belong, all we have to do is be human. Thanks everyone for your patience. So good morning and welcome to the first of our free Happiness and Its Causes webinars. I'm Beth Phelan, Executive Director at Happiness and Its Causes, and we're absolutely delighted to be offering a series of webinars this year to help our community stay positive and uplifted in these tough times. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land from which we broadcast this event. I would also like to pay respects to the elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Always was and always will be Aboriginal land. It's wonderful to see over 600 people joining us today for a discussion on how to stay positive when you have lockdown fatigue. The panel will run for 40 minutes, followed by 20 minutes Q&A with the audience, and you can add your questions to the live chat. If you're having any tech issues, a quick refresh will generally fix it. Otherwise, go to the reception page for troubleshooting info. And now I'd like to introduce our wonderful panellists. First, Dr. Maria Silva, positive psychologist, international speaker and consultant who teaches internationally at the intersection of resilience and flourishing and author of Happiness After Loss, joining us from the USA. Hi, Maria. How Hi. are you? Hi, Beth. Hi, everyone. Wonderful to be together again. Yes, indeed. And joining Maria is Dr. Zach Seidler, clinical psychologist and leading advocate for men's mental health. He's the director of mental health training at Movember, who do such a, a fantastic job of raising awareness of a range of men's mental health issues. Hi, Zach. Great to see you. Beth. You too. Hey, everyone. Yep. Nice to be here. And then we have Professor Ross Menzies. Ross is a CBT specialist working with obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety disorders, and post-traumatic stress. So we'll have a lot to bring to this discussion. Hi, Ross. Lovely to hi, see hi. you. Hi, Beth. Hi, Maria, Zach, and everyone. Great to be here with, with you all. And finally, we have Gillian Coots, Mindful Leadership Consultant and Australian Country Director of Potential Project. And Gillian will be, as well as contributing to the discussion, she'll be moderating the panel. So hello, everyone. Great to see you all here. And I will head off now and come back at the end to say thank you. Looking forward to it. Thanks so much, Beth. It's so lovely to hear your dulcet tones out loud. And <laughs> welcome, everybody. And we're so glad to be here. And just to get us um, it sort of centred and anchored for this conversation, I thought we might start with a really brief settling practice. Mm -hmm. This is something that I often do at the start of any meeting that I'm doing. Um, it just helps me to actually arrive mentally here as well as physically, particularly when you have quirks and things at the start that can kind of keep you flustered. And I know a number of you are having some tech issues getting in. So we might just take a moment. And if this um, if this suits you, you might like to close your eyes just to allow yourself to find a sense of grounded balance, your feet flat on the floor. Or if you want to leave your eyes open as well, that's okay. But just allowing yourself to take a few deeper, longer breaths all the way in. And all the way out, really sigh it out. And again, all the way in. 
and all the way out. And as you continue that longer, deeper breathing, just get gently scanning your body on the in-breath for any areas of tension and on the out-breath, relaxing and releasing whatever tension you find. Again, scanning on the in-breath and relaxing and releasing on the out-breath. Now as you just become present to your breath, giving yourself full permission to be here. Allow your mind just to come to rest on the experience of breathing in this moment. So often we rush from meeting to meeting, from time to time, from place to place. It's like we physically arrive but we're mentally still in the last conversation or maybe worried about what it else it is we've got to get done for the day and invite you just for this precious hour that we have together as best you can to allow yourself to be fully present, to so just do this one thing. And you might even in this moment just check in with your intention for joining this conversation today, this really important conversation about staying positive even in lockdown, fatigue, what is it you were hoping to get out of it? What were you hoping to see realised? And maybe even checking with your, your broader sense, <coughs> excuse me, your broader sense of purpose. What do you want to, con to contribute to the world today? And how might this conversation support you? Why does it matter? And as you connect with those intentions, maybe just again checking in with how you want to show up now then. How might you want to be? And then with three deeper, longer breaths all the way again, in and in your own time all the way out. And again, in and out. When you're ready, bring your attention back to the room to the screen thank you so with that I am so excited um, to be here with Maria Ross and Zach and we invite you we'll be having a bit of a dialogue up front for about 20 minutes and then inviting you to contribute questions so I invite you actually to contribute questions through the chat as we go because we'll be able to see those and then um, we'll have a good 20 minutes to dive into Q&A as part of our conversation together but before we get there, I'd really love for each of the panellists to be able to really introduce themselves. And I wanted to ask a question, which is, how have you all been going during the last 18 months? What, li what has life been like for you? What have been some of the challenges? And what have you learnt about yourself as a result? And Maria, I'm wondering if I can throw to you first with that question. Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, you know, it's been... A, it's been a bit tortuous, actually, and um, for for good reason. The day COVID nineteen hit, eighty five percent of my business disappeared overnight, and four of our five children came home to shelter with us for for many months, which was lovely and stressful. And rebuilding a business back again is oppor is an opportunity and stressful, and. Um, in the middle of, of the first year of COVID, I actually lost two dear friends, one to cancer, which was expected. And then his wife, a month after he passed, was diagnosed with stage four cancer and passed quickly. And so couldn't be with them in the way that I most wanted to be with them. So all of that was true and created a, a very quick unsettling feeling, a very quick... Um, high stress experience most days, high pressure within myself, and, and also a dilemma, and I'm curious if anybody in the chat experienced this as well, the dilemma that I believe that I ought to be doing better. I ought to be feeling better. I teach positive psychology. I ought to be more positive. I teach my specialty is resilience. I ought to know what to do, you know, like all of these mental ruminations about what should be true. And how I was falling short, I 
one of my dearest friends during the pandemic said, I, I'm, I'm going to give myself a mediocre grade for how I'm, I'm showing up. And that, that felt exactly accurate. Um, so while all that was true at the exact same time, I was privileged and am privileged still to be part of conversations around the world of people learning to adapt in ways that they had never imagined were possible mm -hmm. for them of parents showing up for their children so deeply and consistently day in, day out, of businesses awakening to the fact that the people who work for them are human beings, mm -hmm. and, and a beautiful kind of pulling back of the curtain in my own life and in everyone's I worked with about what it means to hold living and loving and mortality while working. And so I have to say there was also a preciousness that was present. Um, a couple of things helped. Jillian, should I talk about that or do you want to? Yeah, I'd love you to, to talk a little yeah. bit about your own experience. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot didn't work um, because I'm a positive psychologist. I have a huge toolkit and I, I kept diving in the toolkit and, and a lot didn't work. And uh, most of it didn't work because I was exhausted because every day felt like a year and every year felt nearly impossible. It's certainly that first nine months. So it took me about nine months to figure out that what was going to work was rest. Mm. And so I doubled down on rest. And once I doubled down on rest, I was able to do more in terms of exercise, which is a huge boost for me. And once I had a little more vitality in my physical system, I was able to actually take advantage of some of the other practices like gratitude practice. And um, I, I do a, a writing practice around beauty and appreciation these days. So, so really the, the first key was the permission to just rest. And then from there I could build forward. Mm. And did you learn something about yourself as a result of all of that, Maria? What did, what did you kind of, what emerged for you? So I learned a few things. I learned that 25 years of therapy isn't quite enough. <laughs> that, that there's still more to learn. Um, I did learn. I did learn that it, I, I am faster at giving myself permission to be human than I was when I was younger. And I needed a lot of that. Um, I also learned that I can love my children, even though somehow they don't know how to make toast. <laughs> and, and that's my fault. That's on me. So back to the permission. Um, and I, and I learned that um, I can't do this work if I don't center my own health and well-being mm -hmm. almost equally to those I take, I care for. So that, I think that was the biggest learning. Mm, it's a real coming home to that inside, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, thanks, Maria. And there's so much more to unpacking that, but I'm I'm imagining that, that once we get past some of the tech issues people are having, there'll be some great questions that come through as well. Maybe, um, Zach, thank you so much, Maria. Zach, can I throw to you? Can, can you give us a bit of a sense of your context and what's life like been for you during this last mm, 18 months? For sure. Some Talk of the challenges. Times. Maria's really set the tone here. Um, I, it's been a whirlwind. I'm not one for, um, lots of backwards looking. Um, I, I'm very much a, a forward thinker, um, which is probably where, you know, my productivity and anxiety come from in the same, the same breath. Um, but the, the way that my, my, you know, 18 months kind of started, uh, was, I was in Melbourne, I'm now in Sydney, and my my mum called all of my siblings, who are all adults and have not been in the same place in a very long time. Uh, one of my brothers is in New York, the other lives in London, um, and she said, I've booked you all flights. You're all coming home. So it's a, a very much a, a nest situation, and we had no control over the matter, um, which is beautiful. And so we all descended upon the family home for the first time in a decade. Um, and to, to add to all of that, my brother came with his uh, fiance who had not been to Australia before and came to the family home with all of us who she'd met briefly and they both had COVID. So we were all in, in isolation. This was before hotel quarantine. We were all in isolation together, my whole rambunctious family 
um, extremely loud, extremely opinionated uh, for an extended period of time. Um, and it required uh, that tension that Maria spoke about, which is that I am so bloody frustrated and I love them so much at the same time. Um, and holding that, you know, dualism in a way, the dialectic, mm -hmm. they can both be true, was really important. Um, and I got over the first the first few days of the tension and, and what, what kind of pulled me through, um, which was a double-edged sword of sorts, was that I knew the world was going to shit and I knew that my role was going to become increasingly important. And so having um, that, that value of, of being needed, I guess, um, was, was the thing that got me out of bed in the morning and mm. you know, drive me and, and energises me. But what I realised, as Maria said, is that if I didn't have, it energises me, but I still need enough to get started. And if I didn't have that, uh, you know, reserve, it was it was it was tough. Um, I'm a beach addict, so any day it was grey and rainy was not a good vibe for me at all. Um, <laughs> so I started to realise uh, when your world, you know, really compresses. Uh, you know, the thing about me is that um, something that has always bothered me is, is is FOMO, is fear of missing out. You know, it's something mm -hmm. that, you know, whether it's work or friends or otherwise. And what this did is it, is it completely got rid of that. And I'm so thankful yes. because there was nothing to bloody miss out on. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so, I was so free from that, from that burden uh, that, I suddenly could could focus on my rituals, and we'll speak about them later. Mm -hmm. I've read one with Maria that she really doesn't like, but I'll, I'll talk about that later. But the idea around uh, understanding what I needed each day, understanding what really replenished me, um, and you know, allowing the space for me to uh, you know control what I could and, and leave everything else um, you know to the world. Uh, but I doubled down on work. It gave me great. Uh, a great sense of purpose um, mm. and to be honest, which is a, which is a very strange feeling. Um, but the most grounding thing in the world is, is witnessing other people, you know, overcome their suffering. And it made me so, um, so motivated and, and I felt so privileged to witness it. And even when people, you know, didn't see the light at the end of the tunnel for me to be the person that could hold that meant that day to day was always going to be okay. I think. Mm. But I'm very mm. much, as, as positive psych as I'm going to be in this session, I'm looking forward to the end of this. <laughs> let, it, let it end. <laughs> Please, God. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, Zach. So it sounds like there was some things that you already knew about yourself. What was the most surprising thing to you? Mm. Yeah, very good question. Uh, the most surprising thing was probably um, that I could that I could continue on without having those, my, my friend, my friend network, you know, I've, I've had friends, the same friends since kindergarten and they've always been so present in my life. Um, and not having them there, I had to start to, uh, you know, ascertain different entry points in a way to, mm. to enter as well, which was really, really important for me. And so, um, adaptation, uh, yeah. You know, I'm, yeah. Flexibility is, is everything. And, um, the really important thing, and I'm sure we'll get onto this, is how am I going to continue to hold these learnings in a world that is going yes. to rapidly shift around me now as well? Um, mm. But I guess that's continuous work that we're all going to do. And another 25 years of therapy, Maria, we'll get there. <laughs> that's right. I'll meet you on the couch for sure. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. And Ross, Ross. Yeah. Happy look, um, I, I wouldn't say it's been easy by any stretch. I, I've got four children, three of whom are still at home, uh, one of them sitting the high school certificate this year, yeah. uh, and two parents, uh, both very aged, in nursing homes that uh, I was thrown into disconnect mm -hmm. for. So on the one hand, I had increasing demands in the house because we literally were all bunkered down trying to educate our children. Every parent out there knows uh, the, the, the joy and pains of home teaching. I have massively increased respect uh, for every teacher in this country. Uh, when I see mm -hmm. what they have to do, um, it's, it's, it was hard enough controlling my three 
let alone classrooms. Um, but that, um, uh, you know, if you like, wonderful pleasure of being immersed with my children across the period has been fantastic, but also mm. a huge responsibility and with, as I say, parents at a distance that I couldn't, couldn't help and I couldn't touch for long periods of this. In each of these lockdowns, I think that's been the hardest thing for me, that I can't mm. be physically with uh, my, my parents. I can't stroke my mother's hair. Yeah. It's a terrible, um, very difficult business and that I very much want uh, back as quickly as, as we can have it. I think, uh, so it's not been easy. The other thing, mm. picking up one of Zach's points, I think the increased responsibility in mental health services, the sudden mm. uh, inundation into mental health services, the responsibility to look after people at a distance often and often who were isolated, uh, I think has been extremely difficult for people in mental health services, that, that we're seeing people on screens mm. and um, I, I realised how lucky I was to have a house full of people uh, and how uh, people that I was seeing at times living on, on their own, uh, not getting out, uh, the, the psychological pain of that, of isolation. We're a social primate. We're meant to touch each other and be with each other. And to watch that over this period has been very, very difficult. So, um, mm. yeah, it's not, it's not been easy for me at all. I, I think uh, they're juggling a lot of various responsibilities as well as I can. Yeah, so many hats at the yeah. same time. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And that's, what's, what have you kind of learned about yourself or what's something that surprised you? I think I learned how lucky I was mm. to have people that love me in my home with me. I think I learned mm. that in a fundamentally different way. Mm. Um, the, the, the depth of feeling in the house compared to uh, before this, it's been very good for a lot of families. If there's mm. if families are operating well and there's not... Uh, you know, parental tension and family tension and you're not in a situation of abuse, for example, I think for a lot of those families it's been a wonderful thing and it certainly was for me. So a deeper recognition of how wonderful it is to love and be loved. Uh, I think I, I probably learned that I could be more flexible than I would have thought. Um, I'm a fairly... I would have thought of myself as a fairly... Um, uh, you know, organised, rigid sort of person. I do things a certain way and suddenly mm. it had to be done completely differently and it made mm. me think very differently about how to connect to people. And one of my great passions is wine collecting and wine tasting and suddenly I couldn't sit around tables with my regular group tasting things. So I took to filling up um, small bottles, little 100ml bottles, and delivering them, getting them delivered from households of friends and having Zoom blind tasting sessions. Um, I, I, I found ways to connect to people that, you know, worked worked well uh, mm -hmm. in the same situation. So trying to, and I'll pick up on this a bit later, trying to control the things I could control and, yeah. and learning, to, learning to accept the things that I couldn't, I think, which is one of the most fundamental uh, teachings of uh, Stoic philosophy that has imbued all of cognitive behaviour therapy. I'm a CBT-oriented therapist and CBT rests on Stoic principles uh, of learning to pay, pay attention to the things you can control, mm. learn to let go, not just let go, but learning to love the things you can't. I mean, Nietzsche, the German philosopher, uh, when he coins Amor Fati, tells us, uh, love the fates. In other words, I wouldn't have it any other way. Now, it's a hard thing to do in COVID. Would you really not have it any other way? But this mm. is the great teaching of Nietzsche. Can I learn to not only accept but embrace whatever the circumstance I, I'm in and uh, learn learn from it? Yeah, great, Ross. Thank you. And, I, um, Ruth, I take your um, comment in the um, chat around can we get to strategies already, for God's sake? Um, and I, so I will um, incorporate some of those as I introduce myself. So I'm Gillian. I head up the organisation, The Potential Project, which um, is a global 
mindful leadership and organisation development firm. But my, a bit like Maria, my world completely went to pot in um, March last year when everything was, um, you know, face-to-face and all got cancelled. And and I think one of the things that's been really powerful me, for me throughout this time is to continuing to journal. So each weekend I would ask myself seven questions which were you know what can we do at the moment because it was trying to think of the flip side of the restrictions what what are we allowed to do at the moment um you know what 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 have I been doing who have I been seeing and and what am I noticing and what are my hypotheses about what's going to happen next and it's been a really interesting journey over that period of having this record of each week checking in how am I how are we what's going on and and having this opportunity to kind of take a step onto the balcony because I think one of the big things I've learnt during this time is how important to notice the meaning we're making of something. And as we've gone into the second lockdown here in Sydney, um, I'm at home with my husband and 11-year-old son. We've got two sons that are out of the house now. Um, but the 11 year old has been a complete nightmare on the uh, home learning front. Very reluctant learner. Um, and at the same time, it's been an amazing opportunity to sit beside him and observe what it's like to be a kid going through this, the schooling system. And there was one point where, where he got um, into a lot of trouble for, um, uh, so for swearing in the chat. <laughs> And um, and when I looked at what he'd said and I looked at the situation he was in, while it was completely inappropriate that he did it, it was really frustrating to be in this meeting where the girls were, you know, it, it was a situation which was really frustrating. And so there's been some moments where I've just gone, oh, wow, I get, I I, I see you as a human rather than my annoying son who's made, you know, means that I've got a phone call from the school. So what I've learnt is that it takes time to step into the shoes to be a witness to other people around you. And the meaning I make of that can either be, oh, for God's sake, why do I have to be here? Or it can be curiosity and how how do I show up here? What is what's needed right now? And, Maria, picking up on your point of sleep, I'm definitely much better at that when I've had a good night's sleep. When I've been um, sleep deprived, I have been much more likely to have the little thing on my shoulder going, mm, you're not doing enough right now. Mm, you could be more helpful to people. Mm. And and the ability to kind of observe that voice, which I think we all have, um, when I've had a good night's sleep is much more powerful. Um, and I think the other biggest learning for me has been um, uh, the notice bearing witness to the kindnesses that have been happening between people so this this idea that when you I loved it Ross when you were talking about delivering wine to friends this ability to kind of reach out to people and even reaching out to people to we don't know to say are you okay do you need anything um the sense of community spirit and all of that sort of stuff that's emerged as a result of this so for me I've really learned that when I focus on how others are I am much better in myself, just in my mood, and not in a, oh, I like you the two, two, two shoes kind of thing, but in a genuinely stop fascinating about yourself and, and start getting a perspective on someone else it usually fixes a lot of the woes um, that we've had. And, and some of them have been significant, like having no work for a period of time and my husband's lost his job and all of those things. So there's been some real reckoning to be reckoned with in a way. But I want to throw to um, a question that came up earlier and I invite you now, please do keep your questions coming through. And I think, Ross, you touched on this slightly. The um, How can we help others who are feeling isolated, that we can see are feeling isolated and distressed? Maybe can we throw to that question, I invite each of you to kind of um, dig in with whatever it is that you see can be helpful. I, I think... Uh problem solving so so finding ways to connect to people um you know this we're lucky that this pandemic has happened in a period of technology we can see each other we can talk um we can connect we can send things to people and and people i think did get get good at that but i think firstly just being incredibly mindful of how severe the effects of isolation are it's one thing to connect to somebody every four or five days, but if they're living on their own and you're one of only two or three people that are connecting, that person could be in those walls for 
long periods of time. So uh, trying to problem solve, I, I connected to some people by just having a Zoom on while we were watching movies. I know many people did the same thing so that there, there's a sense of them being in the room. Problem solving mm -hmm. and trying to uh, spend as much, you know, time with the person as you possibly can in any way you possibly can. Yeah, beautiful, Ross. Thank you. Back, Maria. I'm happy to, I'm happy to jump in. The uh, Something that I've been giving advice to people who are helping people who are isolated, so it's a, it's a secondary uh, relationship, is, uh, is to understand your own bounds here um, because, and this is just full stop when we're helping others, uh, yeah. that people will go out of their way and drain all of their resources um, to the point where they're useless as a as a as a um, you know person to lean on as well something that you know people talk about love languages whether it be gifts or you know um, I, I also think it's really important to realize what role you can play that you are best at playing I'm mm. not a gift guy it's just never been my thing I'm not going to suddenly become one I know that I'm like a a words kind of guy so I'll send letters and I'll do the things you know that I, and I'm not I don't I don't need to play every role for somebody yeah. um, and so potentially helping them find and this is always what we do full stop especially when someone's at, at risk or someone's someone suicidal you try to bring in a broader network a broader team because you holding it on your own is is exhausting and so uh, I, I know what my strengths are and I, I pull in other people um, who have you know the other the other skills i think and then they've got a team of love around them which i think is is much more um useful in many ways because for you to take the call every night from 10 to 12 is just it's too much i reckon yeah i love that team of love yeah absolutely maria I think I want to underscore the part of the question that said that people are having the feeling of disconnection. Um, mm -hmm. There's a beautiful question that the um, consultants over here at McKinsey um, explore when they're talking to people about meaning. And the question is, where and when do you feel most alive? And so that's one of the questions I've been posing with the people in my circles who I think are isolated. And then the follow-up question is, and how can I support you in having more of that or getting more there or celebrating you when you get there? And so, um, of course, beginning with empathy and, and recognizing that that isolation and loneliness are so, so, so heavy a, a burden to feel, to experience. And, and then reminding them of the other aspects of their own living, which has to do with meaning and joy and delight. And how could we actually create moment, help create and support moments where they feel alive? Um, mm. So that that's just a question that I love to play with. Yeah, that's beautiful, Maria. I think that's so important. It's kind of almost bringing us back to the micro moments or the cherishing the 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 bits that we can, as you were saying, Ross, we can control, but also noticing and reconnecting with those um, concepts of enlivenment are really important. And I can see there's a question in the chat that's around supporting um, uh, educators that are feeling really exhausted and and keeping them hopeful. And I can all, think all of us can relate to that, whether it's supporting um, the teachers or whether it's supporting people that we're working with, supporting ourselves, supporting our family, um, when they're high achievers and that's that sense of um, go, go, go. I think one of the things that's been really helpful for me and the, and the, um, the edu we work a lot with educators, the educators we work with, is really getting back to like your Marie, Maria saying, what are the bits of the role that actually enliven you and you know you're making progress when you see this? And it's those moments they would invariably say it's when I get to connect with a child and I actually get to see them. And how can we build more of that into the day? And even if it's not every child every day, it's a child. It's a just creating moments of possibility for deeper connection um, that are actually the the juice of the job um, in ways that make that are really important for others. What what do you see? Zach, Ross, Maria, as when you've got people who are feeling like they're just, they're working their butts off, they're not getting through. I use, I use this. 
<laughs> always, it's always here. Because people don't realise how much the extra 10 or 15% of shit that they're taking on unnecessarily, yes. you know, because they want to please somebody, or because they're being agreeable or because they're, you know, because they're kind and compassionate and giving, but um, that that it's that it's that extra that you're adding on top of your your base work uh, yeah. that is the stuff that is, you know, <laughs> the stuff of nightmares in a way that you look at in your calendar and you go, oh, I can't handle that today. But yeah. you arranged it. I think I told you this, Maria. I arranged things two months ago and then it happens today and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> How did this happen? How did um, so I, I think, uh, you know, talking talking to my future self is re- is really important. And so mm. um, for the for the educators, you know, they want to go above and beyond and we love that. Mm. And that's, you know, but un- understanding, again, understanding their limits and where their best, where their energy is best placed, I think is very important. I've been working with a lot of health practitioners. I work with a lot of ED doctors um, uh, because, you know, they're extremely distressed and they work in a very high pressure cooker um, system. And so mm-hmm. trying to to get them, if anything, to, to find that moment to switch off is so hard for them um, yeah. because of the way that they're trained. And I think it's the same for educators. They're, they're, they've got this inbuilt desire to, to do more, to give more, um, and to realize that, that that's, you know, not always in their best interests, I think is really important. And to focus on really what they're good at and what they're getting the energy from as you as you say, Gillian. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, it is a hard one because everyone wants to do more, everyone wants to give more. Um, but, yeah, I think that the fact that we've all realised how incredible it is that they do what they do, hopefully that will give them, you know, a pause to, to do more self-checks and go, oh, I think people actually realise how fucking hard this thing is. <laughs> That's it. Mm. So thanks for dropping the f-bomb there zach that's really helpful. i'm always here for it don't worry yeah yeah that's really good i think there's been times when i've gone to bed at night and i'm just you know when you have that niggling kind of like Ugh, and it's like my mind immediately goes to try and solve for what is it that's that uh that, that like i i might automatically key into this problem solving and there's moments i've had to go look stand down girlfriend like there is nothing to solve for here it's locked down it's shit like it's just it is what it is and this is what it feels like to be in that and and so there's a bit about the self-compassion like I love the work of Dr Kristen Neff where she would say you know notice the suffering notice that this is a moment when you're starting to around it and you know it's common we're all in this well you know in various forms in various ways and what do I need right now actually I need a good night's sleep let's go like that yeah absolutely if I, Jillian, can it, if I can go, pick Ross. Up, yeah. I can just pick up on that comment. Your the comment about sleep again has triggered me to just say that one of the things I think in difficult circumstances is making sure all of your fundamentals are in a good place. Are you exercising daily? Are you getting in the sun? Is your diet in check? Are you your sleep wake cycle? Are you keeping it, you know, uh, in check? Uh, substance use, are you, uh, is drinking going up? And one of the things we found, obviously, in mental health services is that under lockdown, a lot of problematic behaviours just get a little worse, right? The, the drinkers drank a bit more, the gamblers gambled a bit more, the, the eaters ate a bit more. And so if those things aren't all in check, the ability to not fray at the edges under the other strains when people are trying to give more can all go very wobbly. So definitely... Stepping back and, and saying, okay, what are, the, what are the fundamentals in my life that set me up uh, to function as well as I possibly can? Mm. And are they all in check or are they sliding and finding ways to get them back uh, in check? Because I think, I mean, there's a lot of research suggesting when those things go, mm. uh, you, you start to become predisposed to other problems, to mood problems, anxiety problems, and all sorts of other problems. So holding, holding tight to those boundaries as well. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Ross. One of the questions that I think, um, and Marie, I'm interested in your curious um, family experience in the States. One of the questions was around any tips for coming out of lockdown. So as we kind of move towards um, in different parts of Australia, 
uh, and I don't just sort of recognise that we've got kind of pandemic fatigue, not just lockdown fatigue. So it's not like it ends and we're likely to have bumps and things on the road. For all of you, what are some of the things that you think are important for maintaining um, real positivity, not toxic positivity, um, during this time ahead? You know, I love the model that Joan Borisenko teaches about when things fall apart, you know, sort of we, we descend for a while into the cesspool or the pit, which is where we've been. And then there's this liminal space and eventually new norms begin to emerge. And in this liminal space, which is where we are now, think it, we need to sort of enter it with an experimental attitude and check check that we are check our assumptions like oh this is going to be fantastic and then you go to the first you know group of 30 more than five people on a picnic but now you're in a group of 30 and you realize oh my god i this is too much it's i'm too stimulated it's too scary right so to just notice our assumptions about what the reentry is going to look and feel like and be gentle with them and hold them as possibilities but not as not mm -hmm. the only story that's possible um that some things are actually going to be more beautiful than we can even imagine and some things are going to be trickier than we can even imagine and this that i can and this is one of the things to actually someone had a question posted about teenagers during this time it's one of the things that i speak to the teens in my life quite a bit about is you know that you're right that it could be like that and so here's where I use a tool called building in the genius of the and. And is, you know, is there another way of seeing this or another way this might go? And just keep exploring sort of a cognitive flexibility um, mm. um, as much as possible. The other thing is every we know or we have a sense of what works for us and what doesn't. And this is the time to absolutely triple down on what works. Mm -hmm. You know, if exercise is your go-to move, go there. If sending wine bottles to your friends is what lifts your day, do more of that. Like, let's get smart about doing less of the things that actually don't serve us and a little more of the things that do. So that we have the energy to experiment as things open up and 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 try new things and and see what the world is like again. Mm. Yeah, beautiful, Maria. Thank you. Mm. Is that Ross? I've I've witnessed at, at least, you know, we've we've got probably in Sydney two weeks to go until restaurants are coming, and and I'm the person who sits at a picnic and just probes people and, and jabs them until they give me <laughs> give me some detail on how they're feeling. You don't want to be at a dinner party with me, but. The, the, the thing that I've found is that people are, at least internally, um, willing to put up with a lot of, uh, of that uh, teething that is, is going to happen in the next uh, mm. few weeks and months um, that, that, as Maria is saying, is, is kind of unnecessary to a point because they're not talking to others about how anxious everyone else is, is potentially feeling. They're just going, this is, oh, I'm, I'm overwhelmed here, but I'm just going to deal with that. I think the thing that's really important is that there is a, you know, a base instinct of who we are as people. And my favourite role as a psychologist is to go, why? Why do you think that that's who, who you are? You know, just because you've done that before. We've now gone through this 18-month, very strange liminal period where everything has been thrown up in the air. Um, you know, you don't need to go back to where you were before. It's impossible. And I think lots of people are potentially striving to do that. Um, when it's it's a new it's a brave new world. So so I think that uh, holding on to the things that existed in this time, but also um, being open to reinvention, I think is is really important as well. Because there's there's a lot of possibility. You look at the business world now. You look at everyone working from home. Like there is so much shift happening. And if you're if you're open to it and willing to adapt um, in ways that you never thought possible, I think it I think it's pretty cool. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Zach. Thank you, Ros. Yeah, look, all I on a slightly different tack, I'd add as we come out of this to just uh, take a step back and remember our shared humanity in all of this. We've been through this together. It has caused some divisions in communities uh, across the globe, and that's not surprising. One of the areas I work in is in death priming. What happens when we have reminders of death? 
we've been living in a very big social psychology experiment. Every day we get a body count in this country, state mm. by state. Uh, in, in social psych labs, we know that death priming tends to make us aggressive towards outgroups, to people that aren't like us, to people from other religious uh, groups, people of other cultures. So we need to be very careful uh, in the way we come out of this, in, in just uh, re recognising our shared humanity. We've been through a very difficult time together. It should bring people together logically. We live through this time that will be remembered over the long haul. But as we've seen, there's been a lot of division in the community mm. uh, recently as we get close to the end of this. And I, I think it's important to remind us all that, that we need to uh, realise that there can be unconscious drivers of behaviour like death priming that are influencing the way we think about people we pass in the street, people in different suburbs of the cities that we're in uh, and so on. Mm, Ross, that's so interesting to think about the unconscious biases that we're going to be taking mm. out as a result of the, the environment we're in. One of the studies I've come across, um, not done during this time, but also speaks to the bias we have about the way we see each other people and their kindness. Um, this is a group called Common Cause um, in the UK. Did a study where they found that 74% of people would say that they held compassionate values, that they would help a stranger if they felt confident and competent. But only 23% of those people felt that they lived amongst people like themselves. So, so this gap, like, so I think I'm kind, but I bet my neighbours aren't, which is mm. kind of a, a, a apparently an ongoing and enduring kind of bias that we have that we, we don't think others are going to be kind. So I think one of the things that's interesting to me is we've also been really skewed to news over the last 18 months, so the regular press conferences and, you know, I've tried to turn all of that up off, but you still get it in different ways and you kind of need to stay abreast in some ways, but we get really primed for the things that aren't working, the things that are divided. As mm. you say, Ross, the things that are, are divisive, the groups that the groups that aren't compliant. And, yeah, exactly. Mm. And so our ability to just hold a little bit more curiosity as well. I, what if I approach the world as if, most of us are really kind and those that aren't are probably having a really shit day. Like, like you know, there'll be exceptions and I please don't um, kill me for those exceptions. But I think the possibility, holding the possibility of frame is really important as well. Mm. I'm really conscious um, as we come towards the end, if we did a, a round of what are the kind of top things you think that we maybe haven't talked about yet that are really important during this time for staying positive? recognising that there's some that still have a long way to go. Well, I'm happy to jump in. My absolute number, I've already mentioned it, but my number one tip for everybody is where you place your attention. Um, I'm, uh, the, I think the Stoics got it right that the vast majority of human emotional misery comes from desiring things that we can't control, wanting for things that we can't make happen. Uh, when my desires went too far toward a desperate need to see my parents, I was in pain. Um, mm. When I was able to achieve a stoic acceptance of, of that, that I would not be seeing them and it would be some time I got on with problem solving of how I could connect. So placing your energies on the things you can control in your day, uh, I would uh, say is my number one tip for, for managing negative emotion in general. Mm, not just in in lockdown, not just right? in pandemics. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So, something that that jumps out at me that I've been thinking about a lot recently in my my talks with corporates or, or otherwise is is the idea that lots of people try to do the work when they're in a shit space. They try do the self work. They try and they try and overcome whatever's happening when they're in the worst possible mood to deal with it. They're in the worst possible mindset. And so I've, I've always believed very strongly, you know, as, as a psychologist, that I only want to really see you when you're well. That's when the work can be done. Recovery begins when you're well. And so I think that if we can get people uh, doing this, this trick that I like to, to tell, you know, um, my clients to give a go is to tell the people that they love, a few people in their life, the three things that they need when they're in a shithead space, the three things that they need when they're down in the dumps. But to do that when they're well. 
because you have the ability to to actually understand yourself in in a totally different mindset whereas when when you're down in the dumps you know what what you need in that moment might not, not actually be the thing that is going to fulfill you or is going to um, lift you up uh, because you can't see things 360 degrees um, and so I think that really uh, not just coasting lots of people do that when things are good I'm going to close my eyes and hope for the best it'll continue it's got to continue it's not going to it's just life it's the it's the ups and downs and so um, doing all of that internalized you know reflection and not heaps of it you don't want to waste a sunny day on on nasal gazing, uh, gazing. but 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 I think that um, there, there has to be an understanding that, um, you know, scrumptious sourdough is only going to get you so far. And, <laughs> and when we need to understand what are the things that actually nourish us and tell the mm. people who love you how they can help. Yeah, beautiful, Zach. And being prepared to ask for that when you need it. Nice. I'm just um, feeling the the depth of wisdom in the in the room in, including in the chat and mm -hmm. appreciating you know everyone's willingness to sort of um be as thoughtful as possible and as and exposing ourselves at the same time um so two quick ideas the first is i i'm very very invested in centering self-care right now because of burnout around the globe and the, a quick tool to sort of get get you in place for the day is to ask wake up in the morning and ask yourself what is one thing i might do today to either calm myself strengthen myself or inspire myself because those are really the three pathways of resilience calm strengthen or inspire so that's a very pragmatic daily kind of uh, application or tool big picture what, what we know about the most resilient of us is that we often years later are able to look back and say, that was hell. I never want to go through that again. And yet it was a time worth living through because of how I grew. So for those of you who don't mind doing a little visioning or journaling or collaging in and projecting into the future, that's a gorgeous future oriented question to ask yourself if it were two years from now and I'm looking back, and it ended up that this was a time worth having lived through, no matter how difficult it was, what would I be attending to, to use uh, Professor Ross's phrase? What would I be paying attention to? Where would I be putting my energy? How would I be asking for help to pull in Zach's theme? You know, what, what's necessary mm -hmm. and, and what's experimental and exciting so that you can have that experience when we are on the other side of the pandemic. And I do believe we will be one day and look back and say, you know what? I grew. I am wiser. Mm. I'm a little bit more at peace with myself. That wouldn't be a bad thing. Mm. Mm. Beautiful, Maria. Thank you. I think it's so powerful, the ability. So often we get stuck in that mindset of why is this happening? And that kind of the narrow, like just when is it over? And the ability to get on the balcony even, and I love that future, like so you're future focused at looking back. So it's not like I have to be making meaning now, but actually if I was thinking about this in two years, what would I be thinking about? And that's kind of, there's something how more creativity and freedom in that, Maria. I love it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One of the um, things we did during this time as a kind of a, like this sense of wanting to be helpful actually is um, really important to me and my kind of making meaning was we put together a little um, a optimism reset, like a five day kind of, just a like tiny little snippets and videos each day, which um, Happiness and its Course has actually had as part of their newsletter for September. And it starts next week on Monday. So if you're interested to um, get involved, that is completely free. And it actually navigates each of the kind of steps that we've been talking about in a way, you're looking at the role of gratitude and actually helping us access resources to think more laterally and more, more openly about things, acceptance, our ability to make meaning, our ability to then take wise action. I loved what you said, Maria, about um, what's the minimum we, action that we could take that would actually give us well-being here as opposed to all of the things we could do. So if you're interested, um, my colleague's going to drop that uh, link in the chat if you're interested to sign up for that. But I'm so grateful to all of you, um, Maria, 
Zach Ross for being here today. I know Beth, um, you're I think about to appear on our screen to say goodbye, but I'm so grateful. And maybe we'll just do one more round um, from Maria Ross and Zach for any final words. Thank you. Well, I'll just thank the other guys for being here. It's been fabulous. And for everyone that's writing in the comments, Mm -hmm. I agree with uh, Maria's comment about how wonderful it's been to uh, learn from the other speakers, but also from the really lovely input in the comment section. Lots of great ideas floating around in these comments. Um, it's, it's, it's been with a, I'm seeing a lot of people realising there's an emphasis on positivity. And uh, um, I think that came across everybody you know, on the panel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ross. I, I completely agree. It's just what I needed today. Onwards and upwards is my uh, is my is my mantra. You know, there's there's always there's always something something coming around the corner that you got to be ready for, and um, it's it's looking like things are only going to get better. The shitstorm is nearly over, so um, mm. right, let's climb the ladder out together and and hold on to, uh, you know, something that's really important is there have been heaps and heaps of positives as we've been talking about from this this time. There have been so many protective factors when it comes to your mental health as well. Um, that people aren't paying enough attention to because there's drama everywhere. Um, mm. Let's let's focus on what's what's been really nourishing, really helpful, really useful for us, and hold on to that and carry it forward. Mm. Beautiful. If I could just a quick goodbye for one second. I I have been to Australia three times. I cannot wait to come back. <laughs> the generosity of of all of you, as evidenced in the chat with each other, is just. Um, astonishing and and um, elevating and uh, thank you thank you for your warm embrace to each other and to us and so grateful I see Maria and it's so exciting to think Beth that we might be in person in 2022 well hopefully all of you will be apart from Maria because she's in the US but <laughs> perhaps 2023 Maria you never know our luck I'll get my date book. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I just want to say a big thank you to the four of you. It's been a wonderful discussion. Um, I have listened to your insights and I've decided that what I'm going to do this afternoon is control what I can. Uh, now, now I'm going to forget it. I'm going to control what I can. <laughs> Try and remember what I was going to say. Um Give, that's right, give myself permission to be human, have a nap with no fear of missing out. But, <laughs> but thank, you, thank you all. It was, it was absolutely fabulous and we're going to be sending a link to the recordings to everybody so they can go back over um, and take in everything that you've said. Thank you very, very much and look forward to seeing you all in March. 2022. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, so I hope you all got as much out of that as I did. A reminder that we'll be bringing you another free webinar in two weeks on Wednesday, the 20th of October. The topic is how can we build resilient and happy minds in tough times. And there'll be a link added to the chat in a moment. Um, oh, there it is. So you can register for your free ticket today. Also, as we mentioned, we're very excited to be having a Happiness and Its Causes conference live once again in March 2022. Um, it will be a hybrid event, so you can join us in person at ICC Sydney or join the live stream from your home. And as I mentioned, all of our wonderful panellists from today will be joining us at the March event Tickets are now available with a 50% discount and the link is in the live chat. So thanks again to everyone who joined us today. Looking forward to see you, seeing you in a couple of weeks at our next webinar and also in March for what will be another insightful, uplifting and fun Happiness and Its Causes conference. Thank you, everyone.
Oh, hello everyone, how are you? Gently close your eyes. We want to be able to predict outcomes so that we have a sense of control. To belong, all we have to do is be human.